getting that other one up there. So, um, for the introductory side of it, my name is Bob Wrench. Last name is pronounced like the tool. An easy way to remember that, my middle name is Alan. Um, I got my grandfather's middle names. If I had gotten their first names, I'd be Siegfried Francis. I'll take Robert Allen. So, uh, on that side of it, I'm a uh, I'm an MCT. I'm a full-time MCT. I work for Century Training. We're a Microsoft Gold partner in Leewood, Kansas, which is a suburb of Kansas City, metropolitan area. I personally live in Lawrence, Kansas. And that's when I expect to see like fruit flying from many other Big 12 schools right at me. So, um, but I've been a, uh, an MCT since 1995. Started off on the messaging side of it teaching Microsoft Mail 3.2. So I've been uh, committed to Exchange all along and I've been a technical editor on several books on Exchange as well. Last one I did a guide for uh, Exchange 2010. So, um, but I've been working with computers since 1977. I'm one of those guys. So, what we're going to talk about today, we'll get into the preparatory process for the two ex exchange exams. Um, what I would love to tell you is that they're, oh, about equal in difficulty to the Exchange 5 5 exams. No. Um, these are hard. And I think most, any of you have taken any of the new exams that have come out since uh, Windows Server 2012, you know that these are challenging. Um, and I know that I have found them challenging as well. I'm not going to blow smoke at anybody saying, yeah, man, you just walk right on in today. And No, you've got to study for these. In fact, you know, I had a guy come up to me and say, yeah, I didn't think that one exam was really hard enough. It should have been a little bit more difficult. And it's kind of like having a thin person say, oh, I think I need to go on a diet. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, the, the, I found them hard. And I've been around the, boat a few, around the block a few times with these. This is 46 exams, I think, is what I've got in my belt. So, well, you know, I've been doing this since 1995. My first certification was Excel 5 and then Windows for work groups. So I, I'm dating myself on that side of it. But we're going to take a look at both of these. Um, this part of it I'm not, I'm not going to worry about taking a lot of time on because you all know why you're here. You want to become an MCSE in messaging, okay? So you've got multiple levels of certification, MCSA, the entry level side of it. Actually, MTA would probably be entry level these days. Uh, but MCSE comes after that. We've got a bunch of exams we've got to take to get there. And then for those of you seeking rarefied air, you've got Microsoft Certified Master, which uh, I haven't, I know a number of guys that are masters. I haven't heard about any of them that are masters in exchange yet. So I, I haven't talked with, I've got one buddy of mine that's in my neighborhood. I haven't talked with him. But then again, I don't know if he's pursuing it because he's going to work for Microsoft since. But anyway, we've got a number of different new so solutions. The MCSE's back, but now it's Solutions Expert, um, which I think is a good thing because I always like those letters. I think it was a pretty good combination, although now it stands for Solutions Expert instead of Systems Engineer, which I'm fine with. I think if you go to certain states, you can't have the word engineer on your business card unless you've taken a professional engineering exam. Texas is big about that. Pennsylvania, Ohio, I think, were, were big ones about uh, having the word engineer on a business card. So, to get an MCSE in messaging, you have to first of all earn your MCSA on the server side of it. So that's 410, 411, and 412. Uh, or, for those of you that already have a Windows Server 2008 uh, certification for server, you can roll that into an upgrade exam, the 70-417 covers the 410, 411, and 412 requirement. After that, you've got to take the core, the 341 exam, and then 342, the advanced solutions for Microsoft Exchange Server 2013. Um, 
and like I said, I'd love to tell you that these are uh, easy exams, but that wouldn't be the truth. I found them difficult. So, and maybe it's just me. I don't know. Uh, anyway, what we're going to take a look at for these, and these are for people that, if you're an exchange admin, for some of you, it's a professional requirement. For me, being a trainer, it's a professional requirement. Uh, for some folks work in organizations where there could be a raise or a compliance requirement to be certified. Senior admins, third level of support between the exchange recipient, admin and exchange server administrator. But I like this. Three years of experience administering, deploying, managing, monitoring, upgrading, migrating, and designing exchange servers. They're not being specific about versions on that. So. Hopefully everybody meets that requirement. Don't worry, I'm not going to audit the room and ask you if you have been doing that for three or four more years. So, jumping into this, general exam strategies. I'm not, okay, I'm not gonna take a lot of time on this, don't worry, because I know that most of you have probably taken a Microsoft certification exam at one point or another. No? Um, I had a guy in the last session, I did a link here earlier, and uh, he was getting ready to take his first. He wanted to know about starting with the link exam for his first cert. And I emphasized to him that I think you got to start with the 410 exam, which is the, ser the, the, entry, the first server exam. Um, but he explained to me his situation. All he does is, is administer link. He knows more about link than he knows about Active Directory. And that, I think that was both good and bad. So, here's, here's my argument about starting with a more difficult exam and just covering this side of it. Um, I don't know how everybody else here studies and prepares for exams. I know my preparation usually involves a degree of panic and anxiety. Um, and I'm not really kidding about that. I get very anxious when it's time for me to take another exam because they just, they get to me. And, and I'm a guy that's had to take a bunch of them. I don't like taking exams, but I have to take exams. So I think that's one of the reasons why I study as hard as I do to get ready for these things. Because I hate failing them. I absolutely abhor uh, failing exams. And I had one exam earlier this year that was the first one that I had failed in 10 years. And, but also keep in mind that my job is to pass exams and teach this stuff. So um, I, get, I get very, very anxious about it. But I also have adapted my study style to try and maximize my success. Now, I'm also going to tell you all this. The way I study for exams may not fit for you at all. And th that's honest. Well, everybody has a different style of learning. I've learned that from being an MCT and a technical trainer for 20 plus years. In the fact that some people are, who's a tactile learner? In other words, you gotta put your hands on it, you gotta do it. That's the way you learn best, right? How many of you are visual learners? You can see somebody do it, you can learn based on watching them do something. Okay, more people like that too. Now, here's one of the rarer groups. Who's an aural learner? Yeah. Mav and I. And, I, and I'm one of those people, too. When I was in college, I have had the best success when I took lecture exams. Because I, I'm weird. And, and Mav can vouch for that, too. I, I am definitely different from most learners, but in that I can listen. And that's the best way for me to learn. So, for some people that might work for them, but I'll talk to you about a little bit about preparing for exams in the first place. When it comes to taking these, um, manage your time. Don't, get, don't start dwelling on a question. Check it off for review, go on to the next question. Also, a big deal for anybody taking an exam, don't second guess yourself. Because very often, you probably, if you, think you've got the question right and you start thinking about it too much, you're going to go back and you might be changing a correct answer to a wrong answer. Trust your gut. So don't dwell on them. Clear out. Clear your head. Keep moving. Trust your instinct. 
uh, very often you got it right the first time. And I can guarantee you, the person that goes back and starts changing a bunch of, bunch of answers after they've already checked something is probably more likely to fail. So stick with what you know. I like the second statement. Have you come across something that definitely tips the scales? One of the reasons why you want to do a comprehensive review after you've taken an exam is that there might have been a question that came along later in the test that has a clue as to what an answer was that you may have seen earlier in the exam. So watch out for that. What's the point? We all know that there's going to be multiple ways of doing things. But one of the things that you're going to discover as you uh, review and prepare for an exam like this, I'm going to tell you, you have to spend quite a bit of time reading the TechNet library for exchange. One of the things that I find to be rather difficult today with both the link and the exchange certification tracks is that there is today a lack of Microsoft press test prep materials. I said that right? Microsoft prep test materials. Yes, okay. You're not going to find a whole lot out there. Um, the other thing that drives me up the wall is that very often I'm dependent upon um, measure up, transcender, self-test software practice exams. They're not out there yet. So that part of it is frustrating. So what you're going to have to do is make TechNet your nighttime reading material. But see, now that everybody's got a Windows Surface RT, come on, now everybody's got one now, right? No? You, what? No? Oh, he's got a pro. Okay. Well, I thought everybody got both. I thought that was kind of the, the modus operandi. Everybody got both. They already had somebody back at the office saying, yeah, give me one. Okay. So anyway, I, my wife's getting mine anyway, so I don't, yeah. Um, what's that? The DBA got mine. The DBA got yours. Yeah, that's the way it works. Anyway, there might be multiple ways of getting something done you've got to read the question a couple of times because there's going to be something in each one of those questions that's going to be the key as to why one answer is going to be better than the other. And there's going to be one of those answers that you're going to look at and go, yeah, that's not it. It's going to be, there's going to be one that's just flat out wrong. Then you're going to have like three others to pick from, unless, well, except the second level course. And then you've got to be a little bit more thorough. Know your tools. Know the defaults. One of the things that might blow you has, will affect your answers is what are the default settings? Do you enable this or do you disable something to get something done? Okay. What's the, what's the, um, any, of, any of these particular defaults, is it open to everybody or is it automatically closed for everybody? Think about the default clients. You know, when we're talking about Exchange, we know that Outlook is going to be enabled by default. We know that Outlook Web App is going to be enabled by default. But what about POP3 and IMAP4? Those are going to be turned off by default. Okay, so those are the kinds of things that we have to pay attention to. And now more than ever, you're going to have to know your PowerShell. It's just the way things are. We all know that we can go to the, ex the Exchange Admin Center and we can use that as a launch pad for numerous PowerShell commands. But in as much as there's everything we can do in the Exchange Admin Center, we can do in PowerShell. But we all know that there's things we can do in PowerShell we just can't do in the Admin Center. Okay? So take that with you. So 341. Um, this part of it, okay. Everything is on this site. Everything we're going to talk about here, except for the sample questions, as far as the test objectives, I've got to emphasize, you've got to spend some time with TechNet and go through each, each and every one of them. 
what I would also warn you about. You know, you're going to see multiple choice questions. You're going to see what I call procedural questions. I don't know if that's what Microsoft calls them. That's what I call them. Procedures. Step one, step two, step three, step four to get anything done. And you're not going to see a question. Uh, this is where I got. This is where I got to wonder. Okay, who's the Microsoft person in the room that's watching me? Um, the questions you're going to see. What you might very well see would be a list of possible procedures in column one, like a list of five or six or seven different things that could be part of the answer. And then you're going to see an empty column on the right-hand side. And what you're going to have to do is pick out the steps in the procedure and put them in the correct order. Oh, oh, how I love those questions. So, but you know they're going to be there. So when we take a look at these sample questions, if you see a question that says, you know, in step A is option one, two, three, and four, and the next one mixes them up. Know that you're probably not going to see any kind of question like that. It'll be like that, but it'll be, you got to pick up all the options and stack them up. So we've got a plan for high availability. Know about redundancy, the transport dumpster, shadow redundancy, MX records, transport solution. What's happening with your mail flow? Inter-site, inter-org. Uh, what's happening with domain security and transport layer security on that side of it? Um, edge transport services, message hygiene, shared namespace, setting up, configuring DNS. Yeah. Question. This is not 2013 Edge. I mean, are they testing for 2010 Edge? I'm sorry, say that again. Since there is no 2013 Exchange Edge server at current level. There's no. Right, and why they put that slide, why that information's in there, I have no idea. I didn't know why they put that. That didn't make any sense. You're right. Yeah, forget about that. Jeez. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that completely. Never, never mind that. <laughs> My mistake. I apologize. They might. That's funny. Okay, now hang on a second here. Well, the, the message hygiene part of it, and the hub transport fact that that's been integrated with the mail transport services. Right, that shouldn't be there. Sorry. Well, wait. Hang on one second here. Hang on. That's a legitimate question, and I'm going to do real quick. OK, so and it was 70 341. And there is no, that's not I probably should have got them. OK, so www.microsoft, here we go. Now, exam prep, that's not what I'm, core solutions, there we go, this exam, and it's available in English and Japanese. But the skills measured, I see they're, they're mentioning right here, design edge transport. I've taught this class, and and configure edge servers. Now, it's the hub transport rule that's been integrated directly into the mailbox server rule. So going back over here to Exchange 2013, checking the library on that. Exchange Server 2013. Hmm. 
Interesting. And I speak in malware, but that's part of that. It's funny how they mentioned one spot, uh, a, a little bit of inconsistency there as far as the documentation. So. Um, if, if you go to um, MailFlow, there's a section under that that says uh, as transport. Which Using it as transport. So, so OK. So there, yeah. And Exchange 2007 2008 as transport server expects a connection to a hub transport server. In 2013, the transport service exists on the mailbox server. Yeah. But they don't have an edge. Yep. It says above that it stopped at the addition to Exchange 2007. Right. Okay. So I, I hope that's an answer. I mean, they're, they're talking about down-level versions. There were some other things that have popped up. Sorry, I'm, st I'm still recovering from my link. <laughs> okay, because that's what's funny is Link uses their own edge. It's weird. Okay, back on topic. Um, so you got transport solutions, message hygiene, shared namespace. Then we get into configuration and managing transport side of it. Edge server, send, receive connectors, transport rules, accepted domains, all of these things that are you're used to seeing, then you get to the anti spam and NA malware side of it. And here, just an example of what you might see. So it says, you're the exchange administrator for your Exchange 2013 organization. You want to ensure that all messages sent to users outside your organization contain the sender's name, address, division telephone number, and mobile phone number at the bottom of the message, along with a standard policy disclaimer. And the options then get into use the new journal rule commandlet to specify the disclaimer text. And it, this doesn't sound anything like journaling. Do you, does it sound like anything like journaling? No. Uh, the transport rule commandlet to specify the disclaimer text and 80 attributes of the sender. That's more along the lines of what we're looking for. Get mailbox commandlet. No. Specify the disclaimer text and 80 attributes of the sender in the delivery tab of the send connector. And transport rule is going to be appropriate, but this just gives you an idea of some of the things you're going to want to be familiar with. So knowing what each of those various PowerShell commandlets is going to be important in a situation like this. You're the exchange administrator for your organization. The CIO wants to ensure that information concerning new products in development is not leaked to the media of core competitors. You must develop a plan to prevent your users from forwarding messages that contain the name of a product under development to users outside the organization. So what are you going to do in this case? Create a single remote domain entry. Configure the appropriate settings to prevent forwarding. Create a single transport rule with the appropriate rights management services template. Create a single journal rule with the appropriate RMS template. Or a journal rule and apply a legal hold. Well, there's a couple there that I think are fairly obviously wrong. But when we get down to it, this is where we have to have a little bit of familiarity with what we can do with RMS templates. So the transport rules are where this is going to get applied. And then uh, one of the things that you will notice in my speaker notes on that is that there is a link directly to the TechNet article on applying RMS templates and how you would use those. Other things we have to worry about on the mailbox side of things, planning, the database size, storage performance requirements, et cetera. One of the things that does come in handy is going to be some experience working with the mailbox sizing tool that you can download off of the Exchange team blog. You had me at a low. And download that and have some experience with that. Uh, virtualization, capacity and placement, public folder placement, uh, and then validating the storage using jet stress, uh, making sure that you understand what, the, what that tool is going to be used for and downloading that and implementing that. Then we get into configuring and management offline address books, public folders, server roles, managing address lists as well. Also high availability and monitoring and troubleshooting the transport role. All of those things fall under this. Then we get into backup and recovery, managing lag copies. Um, we still have a lot of the same types of functionality you're used to in Exchange 2010 when it comes to dealing with lag copies. Uh, what's interesting is that, is anybody going back the entire 14 days? Who's using lag copies in their environments? How far are you guys going back? Everybody I talk to is going back 12 hours. That's about it. Two weeks. Two weeks? You're going back two weeks? Okay. That's unusual. I mean, I just don't, I haven't, 
You're the first person I've talked to in the last few years that's going back 14 days on that. Anybody else? Have, you going back 14 days as well? One week? Okay. I, I want to say that there was various areas of the federal government are going, going back about 12 hours. But then again, that, that's, probably, that's probably all they can handle with their data storage. Um, but create and configure your email, your mail-enabled objects, team mailboxes, distribution list, linked objects there, managed mail-enabled object permissions, folder permissions, mailbox delegates, all of the things that, you know, are pretty much just part of the regular objectives as outlined on the uh, test page itself. So once again, one of the other things that I've added in here on the speaker notes is that there is a particular TechNet article on recommendations for deploying Exchange 2013 and what you want to apply on the various drives. If you're the Exchange Administrator for your organization, you plan to open another location that will be a separate AD site. You need to ensure that the mailbox servers in the new site have high availability as well as appropriate performance. You need to plan the RAID types and the volumes of the mailbox servers. What should you do? Choose three. Each answer is part of the solution. Use RAID 5 or RAID 1 for the page file volume. I know what I'd do. Uh, let's see. Use RAID 1 or RAID 10 for the mailbox database volume, mirrored or mirrored in Stripe. And then RAID 5, for, or RAID 5 or RAID 10 for the database log volumes. And what's being recommended, mirrored is always going to be, uh, you're going to have better performance when it comes to read operations. Or, I'm sorry, write operations. Um, RAID 5, I don't know if you guys have spent much time profiling RAID 5 for write operations, but the, let's see, how would I describe that? Write operations on RAID 5 sucks. Um, then you get, you know, when you start mirroring and striping, you have tremendous throughput when it comes to uh, just the speed at which you can perform any kind of operation on those types of volumes. Let's see, you are the exchange administrator for Finley Tech. You have Exchange 2013 in a sim single domain, AD Forest. Your headquarters are in Auckland, but you have branches in Omaha, Chicago, and Singapore. You need to make it easier for Finley Tech employees to find email information for recipients from a, br a different branch. The solution should not prohibit finding a recipient if you do not know what branch they work in. And users working remotely should be able to send emails to recipients even if they are not connected to the Finley Tech network. So what should you do? Choose two to complete the solution. And this is going to be similar to what you might see. As far as an example, you got, what, seven different options here. you got to pick two of them. Set up three accepted domains, one for each branch. Set up three remote domains, one for each branch. Set up three address lists, one for each branch. Set up three global address lists, one for each branch. Set up three email address policies. Set up three offline address books. And set up three managed folder mailbox policies. Let's see. So addressing that. Find email information by, for recipients from a different branch. Okay. Should not prohibit finding a recipient if you do not know what branch they work in. And users working remotely should be able to send emails to recipients even if they are not connected to the Finley Tech network. And what it comes down to here, set up three different address lists, one for each branch, and three different offline address books should qualify as meeting the requirements as specified in those Three, the three requirements, we, three requirements we have. On the client access side, we've got a few things here, obviously. Once again, these are all going to be on the test objectives page. Planning and deploying and managing a client access service. Then working with namespaces and client services. And once again, my recommendation to any of you preparing for this exam, take a look at each of the exam objectives. And then go to TechNet and look them up. Read the papers. Because one of the things that you're going to find, there's going to be a lot of different things that you're going to find out on the internet about way, ways people have deployed certain things. But that may not necessarily be what Microsoft's looking for on the exam. I think we, 
you know, most of us have taken an exam to a point where we understand that there's sometimes the way we do things in the real world. And when we're working in the real world, sometimes we're going to, we're going to take some shortcuts. But what Microsoft describes as being a best practice is probably what they're looking for when it comes to their answers, okay? So take a look at every single one of these, find the documentation on it, and go through it. Now, one of the things that, you know, I talk about learning styles. For some people, what I think works, get a pad of paper or have another, have another document sitting by. Read the individual sentences and then translate it into the way you talk. If you were describing this to me, you don't, we don't talk like textbooks, right? God, I hope I don't. I, I have a, a way that I like to communicate. And you know, one of the things we have in our training center is you know, describe your teaching style. I like to be conversational. I like to ask people what they're doing, and then we start you know, breaking down ways we can improve it so I can learn about what they're doing. So we take the information, and then we repeat it, but we repeat it in a way that we normally talk. Write that down, OK? Now, for me, because of my learning style, I don't write it down. I keep a, a little voice recorder handy, and then I say it into the voice recorder. And then because I've got like an hour, hour and a half commute each one way each day, I listen to that when I'm preparing for an exam. And that works for me. So just pointing that out. So plan and configure your namespace and client services. Work with your mobility solutions. Deploying the mobility Outlook web app, Outlook web app policies, active sync policies, quarantine. Uh, deploy and manage agaves. Now that's one that you're going to want to look up because that's going to be something that's new to 2013. Implementing load balancing. And we'll talk about namespace load balancing, SIP load balancing. Wow, SIP load balancing. Now, what does that mean? When you see the word SIP, what do you think of? You think of exchange? What, do you th what, do you, what was that? Link. Link, right. Because one of the things that you have to be aware of in preparation for these exams is the way exchange integrates in a unified messaging environment, unified communication environment with Microsoft Link you are going to see more link-related questions on these exams than what you're used to seeing. Because that's the way exchange is being presented these days, is as part of a solution to corporate communication, tying in with Microsoft Link. So that's something you're going to have to worry about. Plan for differences between Layer 7 and Layer 4 balancing methods, working about with Windows network load balancing because I know that everybody here is probably real excited about using a software-based network load balancing solution. But keep in mind, we're talking about a Microsoft solution. Microsoft's not going to ask you about the difference in load balancing performance between an F5 load balancing box and somebody else's load balancing box, because that's not a Microsoft product. They're going to ask you about what Microsoft can do. And then having to worry about troubleshooting client connectivity with the various tools that are available. Okay. So once again, idea of what we might see. You need, to, you need to secure Outlook Web App with a mutual authentication solution. So what do you think is going to be the operating word up there in that first line? Well, you get two things, mutual and authentication. So we take a look at this. Require certificate-based authentication on the OA virtual directory for all client access servers and issue smart cards to all users, certificate-based for all client access servers. That one, OK, that might be close. Require certificate-based authentication on the OA virtual directory for all internet-facing client access servers and issued smart cards to all users. Now, what's the difference there between A and B? One is requiring it for all client access servers. B is requiring it for all internet-facing client access servers. Then we get into using certificate-based authentication for all internet-facing mailbox. What? No. Does Outlook Web App run on your mailbox servers? OK, so we know that that one we can chuck to the, chuck to the curb. 
deploy a proxy server on the perimeter network and recommend certificates for all hub transport servers. That doesn't seem to really apply to what we're talking about here either. So it's come down to A and B. Now, what's the difference there? Internet facing versus all client access servers. So we're talking about mutual authentication. Is there anything, any other service that handles authentication, say, internally? Like Kerberos? So when we take a look at it, going with a requirement for all internet-facing client access servers might very well be the best answer. Okay? All right. You're the administrator for an Exchange 2013 organization that has a single 80 domain in three locations. The CIO asks you to deploy Office 2013 to all client computers. More users will be using mobile devices to check their email than in the past. You must plan the deployment of client access servers in all locations so that a user's profile settings and mobile devices are automatically configured. What should you plan to configure first? Active sync access, auto discover service, Availability or IMAP 4. In this case, we're talking about making sure that users can connect to their email appropriately, so auto discover is going to be one of the first things you want to set up. All right. Other things we have to worry about. The impact of Exchange on Active Directory. We have to worry about DCs. We have to worry about global catalog servers. You know, there's a rule about global catalog servers when it comes to Exchange. You have to have in every site we're going to have to have a DC, and we're going to have to have that DC supporting a global catalog server in every site where we've got an Exchange mailbox server. DNS changes, preparing domains, schema changes, AD site topology, administering things, user workloads, et cetera, planning and managing role-based access control, so we're making sure that we're keeping the hot side hot and the cold side cold. The users have what they need to get their job done, but no more. One of the things that we have to get used to working with ever since Exchange 2010 is this idea that we're going with a role-based access control model. In other words, we are defining a group of users, and then we will set it up so those users have a finite set of PowerShell commandlets that they can run, and it's going to affect the way that they interact with the Exchange Admin Center. So that's part of the, what we have to manage here. And then we also have to worry about service level agreements, making sure that we can get certain things done within a finite set of time, planning for updates, solutions for meeting downtime requirements, recovery point objective, recovery time objective designs, you know, saying that, hey, we're going to be down, we can recover within this period of time, and this is what we, might, this is what we can tolerate losing. Um, what's interesting from my perspective on SLAs, I spent several years, this is, you know, putting things in a historical perspective, uh, teaching Compaq ASE courses back in the late 90s, prior to the HP Compaq merger. And what was funny is that I taught in, in a couple of different places. One of the places I regularly taught was New York. And Compaq had their training center at One Liberty Plaza, right across the street from where the World Trade Center used to be. And what was funny is that the SLAs that we had in place for Wall Street is that we had to have parts in place ready to be installed within two hours. The other counterpoint to that was uh, in 1998, I had to go teach a class in Edmonton, Alberta. And I had a guy in that class that was from Echo Bay, Canada, within the Arctic Circle. And I tell you what, you could tell this dude never saw the sun. I think if we took him out in sunlight, he might have sparkled. But their SLA was two weeks, depending on the weather. And it was easier to get them parts for their remote location in the winter. That's road truckers. It's an interesting perspective on that. OK, question here. You're the administrator of an Exchange 2013 organization based in Australia. A recent compliance and security audit has found that many users are inadvertently sending personally identifiable information, or PII, outside the organization when they reply to and forward emails. You need to ensure that PII is not sent outside the organization. However, customer service representatives often do need to verify PIIs with customers. What should you do? And this is getting into an Exchange 2013 specific question. 
Create a data loss prevention policy based on an appropriate PII template for your country. Leave all default settings. Create a data loss prevention policy based on the appropriate PII template for your country. And then after testing, change the policy mode to enforced. Create a data loss prevention policy based on an appropriate PII template for your country. Configure a rule in the policy to allow your customer service representatives to override the policy. Then after testing, change the policy mode to enforced. Or D, create a custom data loss prevention policy. Set the policy mode to enforced. And you'll find that, if you start digging into the speaker notes on this one, you will see that there's a link that gets directly into data loss prevention policies. But the third option, creating a policy based on an appropriate PII template for your country, configure a rule to allow your customer service representatives to override the policy after testing, change that to enforced, but that's going to be the appropriate situation in this particular circumstance. Another one we've got, more PowerShell questions that you're going to need to be familiar with. You've created a custom management role based on the database's built-in management role, but you do not want users designed to that role to perform all of the tasks of its parent's role. What commandlets would you use to modify the custom role to remove the tasks that role members are allowed to carry out? Choose all that apply. Each correct answer forms part of the solution. So we dig into this one a little bit. We don't want users assigned to a particular role to perform all of the tasks of its parent role. So what commands would you use to modify? So what we're doing is that we're going through and we're making changes, and what it comes down to, we're going to be removing specific management role entries on a customized version after we've done a get management role to take a look at what management roles are already part of that particular um, implementation. You are a network administrator for your company, but you have a single domain AD forest spread across three sites. You have domain controllers as indicated in the table. Well, let's take a look at that table. Okay, now this one, I think for those of you that have been working with Exchange a while, should be a, should be a given. So right here we've got Auckland. We've got four domain controllers. DC1 and DC2 are both global catalog servers. In Wellington, we've got three DCs. DC6 is a domain controller and a global catalog server. Christchurch has DC8 and DC9. What's missing? This is a little more obvious. So when we go back to it, one of the options, let's see, configure DC5 as a global catalog server. Well, DC5 is in Wellington. They've already got a global catalog server in that site. Configure DC9 as a global catalog server. And when I take a look at Christchurch, that site, we don't have a global catalog server already defined. So I don't know how anybody else takes exams, but that's the one that I would latch on to like a rabid dog. Okay? So when we get to it, you'll see that that's probably going to be the way to go. You know, the thing is about any of these, universal group membership caching is not going to help. You have to have a global catalog server in every site. And then enable DC8 as a what? As a read-only domain controller. Because we do, yes, we spend so much time mixing regular DCs and read-only DCs in so many sites, don't we? Okay. Now, 342, we have some of the same things. Uh, Design, configure, manage site resiliency. Design, configure, manage security. Compliance, archiving, discovery solutions. Coexistence, hybrid scenarios. And this is one you've got to watch out for the hybrids and the coexistence because you're going to see more and more of that stuff kicking. It's ugly, rearing its ugly head. Case studies are so much fun. But you'll be given, you know, I, there's some things I'm not supposed to go into, but... I think you're getting ideas as to what to expect just by bringing up those two little words. Anyway, configure unified, uh, unified messaging, setting up the call router auto attendant, call answering rules. With this one, this is where we start tying even more closely into what Link can do in the enterprise environment when it's combined with Exchange. Managing unified messaging, assigning dial plans, enabling disabling unified messaging features for a user, protected voicemail, et cetera. Troubleshooting it. Once again, we see SIP, quality of service kicking in there, 
and then migrating unified messaging, preparing to migrate, migration strategies, coexistence. Wow, you know what? I look at this, these exam object objectives, I see more stuff relating to link than I do exchange. So use that as a heads up. So sample question here. You're a UM administrator for your Exchange 2013 organization. Your company has decided that all sales staff should use protected voicemail. What should you do? Choose two. And I know in my notes you're going to take a look at, there's a couple of links in there that get specifically into setting up unified messaging dial plans and working with protected voicemail. And what you're going to find is that you've got two options here. Within your existing unified messaging dial plan, create a new mailbox policy called sales unified messaging configured for protected email and then assign that unified messaging dial plan to those mailboxes. Okay? You've been asked to configure unified messaging for the 2013 organization. Your company uses Link Enterprise Voice for telephony. What information do you need to get from the Link administrators to properly configure the UM IP gateway? The fully qualified domain name of the link mediation pool. Hmm. Subscriber access number, auto attendant number, or the FQDN edge pool. Well, let's see. When we start talking about IP gateways, when we start talking about going through link and going out to the rest of the world, we have to use mediation pools to get that done because that's what mediation pools do. They facilitate the communication from inside the organization to the mediation pool, mediation pool to the SIP trunk, then to the outside world. Other things we have to worry about, failover, site resiliency, making sure that we can fail over from one site to the other. So it covers data center activation coordination, DAC, which, um, I would tell you, if you are taking a look at technet.microsoft.com, uh, there are a couple, actually, you know what, if, Brian, do you know, did Scott Schnoll already have his talk about multi-site resiliency and, and DAC? Okay, I've got a link. I've, one of the things I've got in my notes here at the end of this, um, Scott, how many of you know Scott Schnoll? Scott is one of the more prominent and knowledgeable exchange people you'll ever like to meet. And um, when it comes to multi-site resiliency, I don't think you'll find anybody that really knows more than he does. And, but I know that he's got a couple of white papers, but one of the things that I know that he was pre presenting as a session this week was a session on database availability groups and spreading those across multiple sites for, data, for disaster recovery. So I would tell you in preparation for an exam, take a look at that session when it becomes available online. I don't know that any of you are planning on taking this exam tomorrow. I, I tell you no, no, don't, study more. <laughs> I care, okay, but that's definitely one that I'd want to take a look at. Site resilient CAS solutions, client access server, setting that up for site resilient namespaces, namespace URLs, performing steps to site rollover, et cetera. Uh, transport, managing your MX records. You're going to see more and more stuff pop up about how to work with DNS. Because DNS can be as simple or as complicated as we need it to be. So when we start getting into multiple site and failover, we're going to have some issues when it comes to managing DNS, more and more so. Especially your send and receive connectors, rolling over between your transport servers and then troubleshooting everything there as well. Quorum issues, proxy redirection issues, client connectivity, mail flow, data center activation, DAG replication, etc. Hello. Okay, so here we go. You're the exchange administrator for Finley Tech's exchange organization. You have two AD sites, one Omaha and one in Lincoln. You have multiple DNS servers that contain an AD integrated zone of FinleyTech.com. You have multiple client access servers at each site. There's a client access server array in the Omaha site named CAS01FinleyTech.com and a client access server array in Lincoln named CAS01FinleyTech.com. The internet facing site is mail.finleytech.com, which is located in Omaha. 
You need to take precautions to ensure Outlook connectivity will not be interrupted if the Oregon site goes down and the client access servers are inaccessible. What should your disaster recovery plan include? Choose all that apply. Well, I'd first of all make sure that I had a site in Oregon. <laughs> anyway, that should have been Omaha. Um, so choose all that apply. Change the IP address of the A record of mail.finleytech.com to point to the IP address of the CAS02finleytech.com on internal and external DNS servers. Change the IP address of the MX record of mail.finleytech.com to point to the IP address of CAS02finleytech on internal and external DNS servers. Use rep admin to force replication on internal DNS servers. And then it gets into shortening the refresh time of the SOA record. I don't think that's it or the time to live. I do believe that rep admin is going to be a part of it, but we take a look at the first one. So you need to pr take precautions to ensure connectivity will not be if we call it, say Omaha goes down, CAS servers are inaccessible. Change the IP address of mail to the IP address of CAS02. You're right, because I forgot to change that in the second paragraph, too. And that's what happens when I stay up too late working on slides. <laughs> so Lincoln should have been CAS02. I, I, boy, that was, OK. Fix that, Bob. All right, but you do have to use rep admin to force that replication. Uh, let's see, you're the exchange administrator at Finley Tech in the home office in Auckland. Finley Tech has two AD sites in Auckland and Wellington. Your network consists of a single AD domain named finleytech.co.nz. You have the following servers installed, CAS01 in client access in Auckland, MB01 in Auckland, CAS02 in Wellington, and MB02 in Wellington. You've been asked to provide high availability for the mailbox databases and the sites by using database availability groups. What should you do? Well, if we're going to do mailbox database availability groups, let's see, we've got a couple options. We can add a mailbox server to Auckland, use it to create a DAG with MB01, add a mailbox server to Wellington, and use it to create a DAG zero, uh, with MB02. Add a client access server to Auckland to use as a witness server. You add a client access server to Wellington. Build a DAG that includes MB01 and MB02 and use CAS01 as the witness server. And then configure CAS02 as a backup witness server or configure data center activation coordination mode for the DAG. We don't have enough mailbox servers to really justify going with G. So DAC mode is not going to be appropriate in that case. Um, I'm guessing that, go let's see, it says choose all that apply, but that's funny. I guess I shouldn't have highlighted that one. Well, like I said, these are samples. These are ones that Microsoft gave me. So these are the ones that they've approved for me to show. So even then sometimes I, I disagree with some of their answers. Because my understanding of DAC mode is that you have to have at least three mailbox servers before DAC mode is even going to accomplish anything. See, I remember, you know, see, this is, this is funny because Last year, I sat in on one of Scott's sessions, and he talked about DAC mode specifically. And he had a situation like this, and he talked about. OK. OK. I, this part about you know setting up the DAG between mailbox one and mailbox two makes perfect sense. Setting up CAS one. As the Windows server, I'm absolutely down with, and then CAS2 is the backup Windows server makes perfect sense to me. G's the one that I've got an issue with. I've got to, I, I want to verify that one. So, 
Um, other things we get into on the security side, if we've got to worry about permissions, RBAC, BitLocker, smart cards, et cetera, deploying and uh, managing IRM and ADRMS, individual rights management. So working with templates, transport protection rules, outlook protection rules, transport recovery, IRM pre-licensing, all of that. Then we get into interpreting and, and managing auditing, mailbox audit auditing, uh, administrative audit logging, mailbox access logging, basically any kind of auditing that you can do, you need to be familiar with for the enterprise exam. And troubleshooting security related issues as well. Certificates, CRLs, key availability, individual rights management, role-based access control, all of those things pop up. So in this one, you are the exchange administrator for your organization. You need to specify separation of work policies in order to maintain standards and workflows and help to control change in your company. You have the following requirements. Users who are assigned specific permissions and AD will create security principles. Okay. Exchange server services will create security principles. Mailboxes, mail-enabled users, distribution groups, and role groups will be created using exchange tools. Some third-party programs will require the exchange servers to be able to create security principles on their behalf. What type of model should you use? RBAC split permissions, AD split permissions, shared permissions, or RBAC shared permissions? One of the things that you're going to pick up about exchange is that there's been an emphasis on separation of duties. And when you start dealing with split permissions, one of the things that's going to happen there is that the active directory admins do nothing with exchange, and the exchange admins do nothing with setting up user accounts and managing those user accounts. So this part about going with active directory split permissions looks wrong to me. And then we start getting into RBAC split permissions, that doesn't seem quite right either. But they're saying it is. I would have gone with shared permissions. My mistake. Jeez, I did it again. OK, so anyway, please forgive me. I've been teaching 10135 like three times in the last two months. So anyway, I'm, yep, yeah, OK. Uh, other things. You are the Exchange 2013 administrator for your organization. All servers run 2013. You want to reduce the risk of server impersonation. Which of the following would you use the set send connector command to modify your send connector accordingly? Uh, this is where we start having to deal with some of the issues with the way PowerShell is going to work and interact with your desktop. And in this case, set send connector, specifying the TLS authentication level, they're going with domain-based validation, and the TLS domain followed by the connector domain name. And that's going to be the normal arguments that will be associated with the set sender command. But that's going to be appropriate for this case. Other things we have to worry about, archiving, compliance, setting up online archiving, archiving policies, archiving solutions, and then design and configure the data loss prevention solutions. You've got some rules that are already set up for you, but you can create your own. And then you can also have a DLP solution that's designed to meet whatever compliance rules you have to worry about in your environment, and then set up custom policies. You can configure and administer messaging records management. And this one, you have to watch out for. There have been some changes. But you start getting into some of the older style things we might have done in Exchange 2007, move forward to 2010 with retention policies, creating and configuring those, uh, creating your own custom tags. What are you going to allow users to do when it comes to retention tags? And then uh, Removing and deleting tags as well. You've got compliance you have to worry about. Are you going to be working with mail tips? You need to know some things about it, working with message classifications and some of the down-level issues when it comes to implementing message classifications with various clients. And then transport rules as well. So here we get, you are the exchange administrator for Finley Tech. You have a single AD domain named finleytech.lcl. The CIO instructs you to apply the following messaging records management settings for the customer service group. 30-day retention for inbox and deleted items, 45-day retention for custom project folders, and 365 days for all folders. Which should you do? And choose all that apply. So in this case, we've got to take a look at you know, what's the best way to go? Which, which, what's, going to, what's happening at the global level? What's happening as we get closer to the user? 
So with a situation like this, we've got various options. Create a retention policy tag for the inbox and deleted items. Set an age limit for retention of 30 days. Create a personal tag for the inbox and deleted items. Now here's, going back to these requirements, <coughs> the CIO instructs you to apply some settings. Now, personal tags are optional. The user gets to choose whether or not they're going to be applied. Does anything here look like it's optional for the users? I don't see anything there that says we're giving the user the choice about overriding a particular setting or not. So none of these are going to be personal tags. We start getting into retention policy tags, C's a personal, E's a personal, and when we take a look at this, they've got one personal tag there for custom project folders, setting an age limit for retention of 45 days. That one I can see. We're creating a retention policy for the inbox and deleted items for 30 days. That's part of it. Applying the retention policy, uh, link one default policy tag, each retention policy tag, and each personal tag to a policy. Get, applying that to the customer service group, then creating a default policy tag to limit messages to 365 days. Yeah, I, I, okay. It has to do with the overriding of the... I would have gone with the default policy tag for the custom project folders. What's that? I'm just curious if we could go with D instead of E. Do you Yeah, I've just been, yeah. I'll admit, I'd probably want to take a look at, I think D makes more sense. I was looking at E, F, but that doesn't seem, there's, I've got a problem with that one. Yeah, because you're talking about personal tags, and personal tags are something that, you, that the user applies, and there's nothing in that, there's nothing in this requirement that says the users are being given an option. Apply the following message to, for this custom service group, 45-day retention for custom project folders. I'm with you. That doesn't make sense. Uh, D, D over E, yes, okay. <sighs> All right, so another one. You need to ensure that your externally facing client access server XCAS01 has enough resource to support your SLAs for your users' OWA access even during business periods. You decide to use workload policies to assist you in this. Other client access servers should not be affected by this change. What should you do? Each answer is part of the solution, choose all that apply. This starts getting into some newer things that you're going to see in PowerShell having to do with workload policies. So you see those being mentioned. You've got workload policies and workload management policies. And in this case, what you're going to see is that you've got a workload policy being set up, followed by a workload management policy. And then you've got the application of that policy down here in step E. That's all new stuff. The CIO wants you to assign certain users for your organization to a group called Finley Tech Protection. To ensure productivity, you need to make sure that the users belonging to this group are able to search mailboxes of users for messages that may contain the words spam, patents, infringements, or virus. So stop and think about this. Are we, is this going to fall under records management role group? That doesn't seem to fit. You're searching for keywords. You're not actually looking for email that contains viruses or spam. And because you're searching for, searching for information in specific mailboxes, what does that normally fall under? That's going to be discovery management. So discovery management is going to be the way to go on that one. All right, other things we have to worry about. You got coexistence with Exchange Online. This is one of the things that you're going to find challenging. And the fact that we are not just talking about a course that covers Exchange 2013. You have to worry about Exchange Online and the hybrid aspect where you could have some things located in your site and some things being located up on Microsoft's cloud. So that's what, that's what differentiates 
the exams that you're going to see today versus what you saw with 2010. You're going to see much more emphasis on things like federation trusts with Microsoft Federation gateways, sharing policies, organizational relationships, working with the hybrid configuration wizard, setting up for single sign-on. It is going to be challenging in that regard. Um, implementing on-premises coexistence with legacy systems, managing namespaces, proxies, coexistence, firewalls, and configuring that, as well as mail flow requirements, cross-forest coexistence solutions, availability and firewall requirements, mail flow, auto discover, and namespaces, Le uh, migrating from legacy systems. We don't have to worry about going from 2003 to 2013, but you do have to worry about going from 2007 and 2010 to 2013 and whether or not that's going to a in-place location. Are you managing those servers or are you going up to the cloud and how those are going to be migrated across, across the Federation Trust? And then troubleshooting the whole thing. The Exchange Federation Trust, organization relationships, client access, single sign-on, Active Directory Federation services, directory synchronization, forced availability, the various command line tools that are going to be used to verify that things are moving the way you want them to. So, you are the Exchange 2013 Administrator for your organization at 80 Forest. You have a single domain named finleytech.co.nz. Your organization plans to move to Office 365. You plan to use Office 365 on the Finley Tech domain and the finleytech.co.nz on the on-premise Exchange 2013. You do the following. Configure auto discover service for the on-premise domain to use DNS names. And configure the auto discover service for the Office 365 domain to use DNS dom uh, names. Users now state that they try to share contact information between the on-premise and online mailboxes when they receive Permission denied errors. What should you do? Choose all that apply. So we're going to enable a federation trust, set up a new federation trust using a self-signed certificate of the first mailbox server from the on-premise organization. Configure organization sharing for the on-premise and Office 365 organizations. Create a new sharing policy and apply to all organizations. Or E, modify the default sharing policy. And in this case, it's recommended that we go with setting up the Federation Trust, configuring the organization sharing for the on-premises and Office 365 organizations, then modify the default sharing policy. On this slide, you'll see that I've got links for all three of those uh, particular pages within the TechNet article. Now, that second one, B, set up a new Federation Trust using a self-signed certificate. Does that sound like a real good idea for something that's being based out on the internet? No. <laughs> okay. And then sharing policies and applying that. Uh, you have an Exchange 2010 SP1 organization. You are in the process of transitioning from Exchange 2010 to 2013. You have an Exchange 2010 Edge Transport server in the organization configured for Edge Sync. What types of servers will it be able to synchronize with? What's that? You've got... It's got to be, it's the only one in there is going to be A, because the hub transport role has been integrated into the mailbox servers in 2013. That I would have to verify. But the thing is, none of those others are hub transport servers, and you can't go directly to a mailbox if, if, uh, if one of those questions, if one of these has to be right, the only one that is right is going to be A. Yeah, none of the above was one of the options. Okay. Um, what you're going to see, one of the things I would tell you is when it comes to some of the breakout sessions, some of these have already gone by. But what you are going to want to do is perhaps take a look at them uh, when they become available online. So you've got B314 on high availability and site resilience, virtualization, on-premises upgrade and coexistence with 316, exchange archiving policy, moving, uh, move, delete, or hold. I should put a comma there between the move. And then you've also got exchange server tips and tricks. That's Scott, one of Scott Schnoll's sessions on B318 as well. And then you've also got some hands-on labs downstairs, deploying site mailboxes, using Server 2013 Admin Center and deploying and managing exchange mailbox high availability on the HOL area. 
I hope those are all available. Lastly, you've got the exchange group downstairs, both on the floor covering 2013 and online, uh, in Hall D. And if you're looking for me later, I'll be working in certification tomorrow afternoon. I'm available on LinkedIn. You've got access to my slide deck, and you can shoot me an email as well. Brian? Sweet. This guy comes in handy. On that, other things you've got, I wish that there were more test prep materials out there. You've got the 341 and 342 courses. Um, the 341 actually is being revved. I believe the 340, uh, 341B version of that course is going to be available the first week of July. I try, we ran 341A in my shop, and I would tell you wait for 341B. Um, you've also got 342. I don't think that one's been released quite yet. Brian, do you know? Has 342 been released yet? I don't think it has. There's an outline of it, but I, I can't say that I've had it and seen it. Um, then you've got Transcender Measure Up and Self-Test Software Practice Exams when they become available. They're not available yet. Like I said, that's one of my frustrations. Sean? Yeah. Is that Sean? No, Brad. Oh, I'm sorry, Brad. No, you you look like somebody. Un unleashed the uh, 2013 book that's uh, downstairs in the bookstore. Who wrote it? Uh, good question. I got no idea. I'd like to know who wrote it. I know that uh, Safari is showing some rough cuts of some chapters of a book being written by Siggy uh, Jadot and uh, Paul Robichaud's on there. Rand, Rand's good, got a good reputation. Some of those other guys I don't know. I don't know a lot of those guys. Um, you know, some of the authors I'm pretty familiar with, Siggy, uh, Joel Stidley. Um, I don't think Jim McBee's writing a book for 2013. I don't think David Elfassi's writing a book for 13. Barat is going to work for Microsoft, so I don't think he's writing anymore. Uh, I'd like to know what Joel's doing, because his best practices book for Exchange 2013 that he wrote with Siggy is very, was one I recommend in every class. Yeah? Okay, we haven't had, yeah, I haven't had any demand for it in my shop yet. Then again, I've been busy enough with other things. Um, the one that I have to admit, I'm one that I like to take practice exams before I take them. So I've been rather frustrated with the lack of uh, practice exams. And so I'm hoping that those, they, that comes out here soon. But I'm, I'm bookish, and I get tired of reading TechNet, too. I know it's exciting and all. You know, the admin did it. Uh, but... Uh, I'm hoping that that gets resolved. But what I'd tell you, straight out, go to Exchange 2013, open up the library and start on page one. Go through the online side, go through the hybrid deployment side, go through the Exchange 2013, and you just got to go through it. It's rough. It's not the most exciting stuff to read on the face of the planet, but it's, you know, it's kind of the, the lot we have for ourselves. Say, I'm waiting on the 341B course, because we did the 341A course, and I found out that trying to run that class on what they say is 16 gigs of RAM isn't enough. So you need, you need, if if any, of you, any of you are MCTs, get at least 24 gig on those machines and tweak them as much as possible. Also, setting up striping on the drives, if you've got more than one hard drive on the thing will help, too. And assign more than one processor to each virtual machine. And you've got other things out there that you can pay attention to. Channel 9, learn, you've got Microsoft Learning, TechNet, is where it, yeah, that's what I swear by, MSDN for developers, evaluations are out there, you can fill those out, you get a chance to win stuff, and scan the tag. <laughs>